I'm Natasha Kierczuk, and thanks for joining us from our studios in Israel. Coming up in today's newscast, Hezbollah issues a fresh threat to Israel. Israeli schools prepare for possible rocket attacks across the country. And we hope you're ready because it looks like the rapper Azalea Banks is making her way to Tel Aviv. Stay tuned for the latest news in Israel. The IDF has just released a report revealing what really led to the downing of an Israeli F-16 fighter jet by a Syrian anti-aircraft missile. And here's what's interesting. It looks like an error of judgment by the crew was the culprit rather than negligent behavior. The pilot and navigator allegedly acted according to the wrong priorities when they decided to guide a missile that they had fired instead of flying lower as soon as the missile had locked on. The Israeli Air Force has already absorbed the lessons of the investigation into training, and now the details will be presented to the public. This report comes just a day after the pilot who ejected himself from the plane walked out of an Israeli hospital in, quote, good condition. A miracle since he had been seriously wounded. The incident came amid a round of intense hostilities between Israel, Iran and Syria after an Iranian drone infiltrated Israeli airspace from a launch base in Syria. The whole affair triggered Israeli airstrikes against Iranian targets in Syria. According to the New York Times, Iran is operating 10 military bases in Syria with up to 20,000 fighters. The Islamic Republic is reportedly training militias loyal to President Bashar Assad's regime for a possible battle with Israel. And two of the key training facilities are actually just near the border with Israel. The Israeli government has vowed to take every action necessary to combat the Iranian threat. The Secretary General of the United Nations is expressing major concern that direct confrontation is about to break out between Israel and Lebanon's Hezbollah movement. Tensions have been rising between the two sides, with Lebanon accusing Israel of violating its sovereignty by building a new security fence on the border. And Israel is accusing Hezbollah of increasing its weapons arsenal for war against the Jewish state. Now Hezbollah is threatening to act against Israeli oil facilities following an offshore energy dispute between Israel and Lebanon. The terror group has positioned itself as Lebanon's defense against the Jewish state, saying it will destroy Israel's offshore gas platforms if the Jewish state strikes Lebanon in any way. This comes after Lebanon issued an offshore oil and gas exploration tender for two areas along the country's maritime border with Israel, leading to a war of words with Jerusalem. The Israeli government has laid claims to one of the fields in question, drawing sharp condemnation from Lebanese officials. Lebanon claims it will start exploratory offshore drilling in 2019 and will assert its rights along its maritime territories. A finding in the country's southernmost water could lead to a dispute with Israel, which is already developing several offshore gas deposits nearby. Schools throughout Israel are taking extra precaution and preparing for potential rocket attacks. Search and rescue drills are being held across the country as tensions escalate for Israel on its northern and southern fronts. Today, the IDF Home Front Command, the Education Ministry and local authorities are holding a series of drills for Israeli youth. Officials will simulate a scenario of a missile firing in every school, setting off an alarm signal that the students must learn to properly obey. The head of IDF operations, Major General Nitsan Alon, says the year 2018 has a potential for military conflict because of a, quote, gradual deterioration of relations. Israel is continuing to trade attacks with terrorists in the Gaza Strip, and war with Iran and its Lebanese proxy Hezbollah seems more likely than ever. We've been reporting about a lot of tension on Israel's northern and southern fronts, but now we surprisingly have some good news about one of our neighboring countries. Israel's Delek Drilling and America's Noble Energy have just announced a historic $15 billion deal that will provide natural gas to Egypt. The two energy conglomerates are expected to supply around 64 billion cubic meters of natural gas to Egypt over the next 10 years. And as a result, Israel will now become one of Egypt's main natural gas providers. That's a big deal because Egypt is the Arab world's most populated country. The deal with Egypt follows a smaller one that Israel made with Jordan in 2016, which means Israel will now be providing natural gas to both of its Arab allies in the region. 
It's still unclear how the gas will be supplied, but Delek has said that it's possible that it will be supplied via a Jordanian-Israeli pipeline currently being built. Delek's controlling shareholder, Yitzhak Tshuva, is praising the New Deal, saying, quote, the agreement will strengthen the relationship between Israel and its neighbors and increase economic cooperation. Joining us now in the studio to discuss the historic gas deal is Emil Foster, the head of research and strategy at the Israel Association of Oil and Gas. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. So how big of a deal is this for Delic? What, what is the significance of the deal on a company scale and also national scale? It's big. It's big. It's $15 billion deal. Yeah. And, um, and it's really important when for Israel a deal like that because it's... Um, it's, there is, it's given a sign that there is a market for the Israeli gas. Because Absolutely. Well, I mean, I think also this is the biggest deal Israel and Egypt have signed. I mean, many are saying that since the 1979 uh, peace agreement, right? So I think, yeah, it's the, definitely it's the biggest uh, deal that we signed with, with a country from the Arab world. It's, is there a trajectory for Israel, or for Delic and for Noble to also be providing gas to other um, Arab Gulf nations? Not, not to our Gulf nations because they don't need actually right. gas they have, but we have uh, already uh, agreement with uh, Jordan. Right, and from 2016. Yeah, so, so it's, it's kind of, it's, for me it's amazing because we are going to sell, Israel is going to sell 10 BCM of natural gas a year mm -hmm. to Jordan and Egypt. And 10 BCM is equal to 61 billion, uh, million barrels of oil per year. Right. So, well, we we're, imagined that like 10 years ago. I think it's going to be interesting to see kind of the impact that this has on the Israeli economy as well, obviously. But, you know, it's still not clear how that gas is going to be transferred to Egypt. Mm -hmm. What are the plans right now? There's a few uh, options for that. One is to use the EMG pipeline, mm -hmm. um, which uh, Israel uh, import gas a few years ago with this infrastructure from Egypt. So just to transfer... Uh, change the flow of the gas from uh, uh, from uh, be, not from Egypt to Israel from I from Israel, Israel to, to Egypt, Egypt yeah so this is one one uh, option second option is to there is uh, we are going to to supply gas to Jordan right so uh, Jordan in Jordan there is uh, a pipeline called the Arab pipeline right which build to export gas from Egypt to Jordan and Syria and today, it stops in, in, in Jordan, and Egypt does not export any gas anymore. So, so the we, idea is for Israel to kind of take control of that pipeline or, I yeah, guess, enhance yeah. it. Yeah, or to build another one in Sinai. Um, okay. So it's, well, well, here's a question. Are there any other gas deals on the horizon for Israel that you can tell us about? Um, there is, uh, uh, of course, I don't know if there is something that will be uh, soon or something like that, but... Um, in Egypt, there is two liquefaction plants that uh, international company invest in to, to build them billions of dollars. And because they don't have gas, the Egyptians to feed them, um, they 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 not operational today. Wow. And it's it's facilities that uh, when you liquefy the gas, you can send it all over the world. So, so everybody understand today that um, the available gas to feed these LNG facilities is gas or from Israel or from Cyprus, so or both. Right. Yeah. All so. right. Well, I mean, this is obviously a big deal for the state of yeah. Israel. Yeah. And thanks for joining us to tell Thank us about it. Thank you very much. Now, here's some very, very big news. The Knesset has just passed a law that will permit hundreds of Israeli families to exhume the alleged graves of their children who disappeared decades ago. Most of these families are Yemenite who believe their babies were kidnapped by the government to be sold for adoption to Ashkenazi families between the years of 1948 and 1970. Exhuming the graves will give relatives the chance to carry out genetic testing if they find any remains at all. The law applies to families of the children who went missing in the so-called Yemenite children's affair, perhaps one of the biggest mysteries in Israeli history. More than 1,000 families all report nearly identical stories that they went to the hospital to either give birth or do a checkup on their children, and then their babies disappeared. At the time, state authorities claimed the babies had died and had already been buried, but until today, these families believe their children are still alive. Likud Knesset member Nulit Koren has been pushing forward a proposal to allow court order examination of the alleged graves, and now that it's passed, families can finally get some answers. 
Relatives will have to give evidence to the family courts to substantiate their doubts that their babies were actually buried. But once approved by the court, the exhumation costs will be covered by the state. All right, the first deadline has passed for 200 Eritrean asylum seekers in Israel to choose between deportation or imprisonment. But it looks like no action has been taken as of yet. This is a major relief for activists who have been fighting to prevent Israel from expelling almost 40,000 African asylum seekers. The Israeli Population, Immigration and Border Authority has declined to explain why no action has been taken yet to implement Israel's controversial deportation plan. So far, 600 asylum seekers have been given notice that they have to decide between deportation to a third-party country or imprisonment in an Israeli jail indefinitely. The government has labeled this community as illegal infiltrators, but the vast majority, mostly Christians from Eritrea and Sudan, say they fled war, genocide, and conscription in a slave army for a better life in Israel. This is why most Western countries almost unanimously accept them as refugees. But to date, Israel has approved only 11 for refugee status in the country. The UN's chief refugee agency has entered talks with Israel that would see some deportees relocated to a country deemed safe, all in exchange for Israel absorbing the rest. Rwanda and Uganda have denied a secret deal with Israel to accept these asylum seekers, though Israel has already deported thousands to Rwanda in recent years. The majority of the African asylum seekers in Israel say they would prefer to be jailed rather than deported. And now Canada is condemning Israel for its expulsion policy, claiming the concept of deporting 600 asylum seekers per month is incoherent and unsafe. The North American country takes in more African refugees from Israel than any other nation. A group of Israeli veterans from the elite cybersecurity intelligence unit 8200 have just launched a very unique program. They're on a mission to solve social issues through technology, and here to tell us more is Nathalie Meiri, the managing director of the 8200 Social Program. Hello. Thank Hi. you for joining us. So, Thank you for having I, me. I'd like to hear a little bit more about this project. Tell us about it. Yes, sure. So 8200 Social Program is the first Israeli accelerator for social tech startups. Uh, we take startups, we handpick startups that aim to solve a significant social chain, uh, um, problem. Uh, and uh, they do it through technology. In, interesting. Can you give us an example of you know, yeah, some of Yeah, sure. The, so we have a very diverse uh, fields of uh, interest, such as okay. people with disabilities, the elderly, promoting gender equality, parenting, education, and all of the problems that are not being solved top down, we're seeking for solutions bottom up. And of course, and that's through technological means, like you said. Okay, so how yes. how did a group of soldiers from this, you know, uh, unit come up with an idea like this? Yes. Yeah, so after uh, we thought about harvesting the human capital of the 8,200 uh, population, and there's a lot of it, yeah, and there was a lot of it, and it's very successful. We saw that there are a lot, a lot of accelerators for tech in general, but not for social tech, and we understood that the fact that technology can be uh, the catalyzator for solving significant social issues, so we can do it through accelerator, through a whole different acceleration program, aims only for these uh, entrepreneurs. And I think people don't even understand how much these industries are growing. I mean, the elderly population is growing significantly, right? So Definitely. there's seriously a need for technology that can address the needs of that community. Um, and I'm sure it, it goes the same with a lot of the other industries you're addressing. Now, um, I know you're many, you know, you're very, you must be very proud of many of the <laughs> projects that you guys are, are doing here. But can you tell us about maybe your favorite startup or? Yeah, sure. So I'll just mention that despite its name, uh, the 8200 Social Program aims to assist all social tech entrepreneurs, not only 8200 alumni. This is very important just okay, in, that's for, good to know. in order for people uh, to apply. And uh, we provide a nonprofit uh, accelerator. We do not take equity nor IP rights from the participating startups. Uh, for example, we have two interesting graduates of the fourth cohort. Currently, we're on the middle of the fourth cohort. Uh, one of them is Voiced. They're translating simultaneously impaired speech into regular speech. And they've raised wow. more than six and a half million dollars. And they've won several international competitions and collaborating with different countries. So for those of our viewers who are watching and want to get involved somehow, how can they do that? So uh, currently we're in the middle of the fourth cohort, but applicants who are willing to uh, participate on the fifth cohort are more than invited to uh, pre-apply on our website, www8200 
thesocialprogram.co.il. The registration is open during the whole year, and we just reach out to the relevant entrepreneurs after we open the registration phase. Very cool. Thank you so much for joining us, Neta. Thank you. Quite the power woman. Thank Thanks you very much. All right, that's it, my friends. A group of visiting NFL players are about to wrap up their trip here in Israel, but not before the Israeli prime minister had something to say about it. Netanyahu is asking the visiting NFL delegation to use their influence back home to gather support for the Jewish state. The seven-player delegation, which includes the NFL's only Jewish brothers, Jeff and Mitchell Schwartz, met with the prime minister after spending the past few days traveling around Israel. During the meeting, Netanyahu took a trip down memory lane and told the players about his first NFL game in the 1980s and how by the end of the game he was standing and screaming in excitement. At the end of the visit, the Schwartz brothers presented Netanyahu with a blue and red jersey that each had his nickname, Bibi, written on the back. Now, during their trip to Israel, the players visited the Dead Sea, Jerusalem's Western Wall, the West Bank, and the Gaza Strip border. The organizers of the trip, American Voices in Israel, say they hope the NFL players now have a better understanding of what's going on in Israel by seeing what's actually happening on the ground. All right, guys, now here's an extremely random fact for you. Did you know that the island nation of Papua New Guinea has never had a dairy farm before? Well, that's until now. A group of Israelis have actually just built the first ever milk farm on the Pacific nation. This may sound random, but it actually really isn't. Israeli dairy farms are known to be the best in the world, and countries from Mexico to England to China have long sought Israeli expertise in the industry. Until today, residents of Papua New Guinea didn't have access to local dairy and could only buy imported dairy products. But now that's all changing because of the Israeli company Aleph Bet, which plans livestock and farm buildings. Aleph Bet is using Israeli technology to assure that cow sheds will be comfortable in Papa's tropical climate, so that the cows don't get too hot in the humidity. The Israeli company Afimilk is helping provide the agricultural and water technology to grow grass and corn for the animals. Right now, the farm is home to 515 cows, but it may eventually expand to 800, meaning locals may now be able to start getting used to fresh milk. Joining us now in the studio to talk about how to build a native ad network for your company is Avinoam Rubinstein, the founder and CEO of My Six Sense. All right, so let's break this down for all, all us simple people. What is uh, native advertising? So native advertising is a new form of advertising where brands and marketeers can uh, put together content, either an article, video, or any other way that engage with consumers uh, it's called native because it's blend natively into the publisher site. So the idea is that you're watching an ad, but you don't realize that it's an ad necessarily, right? So actually... <laughs> Which uh, is kind of controversial, but it's effective. It is very effective. Actually, it uh, works very good. Our first campaign uh, was for Pampers, uh, uh -huh. and uh, it reached 20% uh, uh, engagement, which was kind of 10x versus any other... Um, uh, type of advertising. Type of advertising they use in the same time. Uh, you know, the overall reaction for that from consumers is the fact that it's uh, uh, not taking the user um, attention from the real content. Right. Uh, but on the other hand, it do provide engagement, the right engagement for the advertising well, marketing. Well, it's interesting because we could, I mean, we're not going to talk about this right now, but there are now laws that are kind of coming out against this type of advertising because it could be so confusing because it's engaging and you don't realize that there's so a need, product that's being, you know, I so guess So you definitely for. need to market and actually there is a rule how you indicate yeah. to the user is actually advertorial. Mm -hmm. uh, so it is, has a uh, brand content in it. If you do it right, it's actually the right mix yeah. uh, for the users. And, and the whole idea is to bring value for the users yeah. together with promoting your messages to the user. Okay, so your company essentially helps other companies do that, right? So we, we are actually a software company. Uh, our core essence are artificial intelligence. We actually have the capability to provide the users the best uh, content, not just uh, advertising or paid content, uh, but rather organic content from the mm -hmm. publisher, together with uh, paid content or branded content, and to provide the user the best experience on one hand, on the other end, we take a, we take care of the everybody monetization needs. So the publisher, the media trading company in the middle, and actually the advertisers that are actually paying for everybody. 
All right, so kind of like a one-stop shop for everything you need in advertising or so, native advertising, should so, we say? So, yeah, it's actually what what we do is actually we're going to the uh, media and uh, uh, marketing companies, providing them software mm -hmm. uh, with all the required, both for the from the supply side, from the publisher side, and from the advertising Very side. Very interesting. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us, yeah. and uh, keep your eyes out for one of their ads. Right. Thank you very much. All right, get ready to Netflix and chill, guys, because the online streaming service has just decided to produce a mini-series about the mysterious murder of the Argentine Jewish prosecutor Alberto Nisman. ILTV's Latin American correspondent Joy Gavijon joins us with the details. Thanks, Natasha. So first, I'd like to give some background about the case mm -hmm. and what this new show is going to be about. The Argentinian prosecutor Alberto Nisman was murdered in 2015 just hours be before he was set to testify against the former Argentinian president, Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner. He was going to expose her for her role in the bombing of the AMIA Jewish Center in Buenos right. Aires. She allegedly covered up Iran's responsibility in the attack, which took place in 1994. Now, this was a huge, huge event in Argentina. 85 people were killed, 300 more were wounded. Alberto Nisman had been investigating this attack since 2005, and he was found dead with a bullet in his head in his apartment in Buenos Aires right before he was going to expose Kirchner. Yeah. I mean, his murder made international headlines and was a really big deal in Israel as well. Yeah, and not only, not only that, it also took 12 years for the justice to, to rule the case as a murder. Mm -hmm, yeah. His death initially was ruled a likely suicide. So that's another reason why the entire story made his way into a Netflix lineup. Yeah. Netflix has produced a lot of content about the Middle East and has even picked up several Israeli TV series, so it's not surprising that the Nisman story is of so much interest. Yeah, now I understand that Netflix has also started conducting interviews with family members of Alberto and, and others who were involved in the aftermath of the murder, that's right? That's correct, yeah, that's correct. The producers have already interviewed Nisman's daughters, mm -hmm. and it looks like they're pushing to interview policemen and even politicians uh, involved in the case. Is there word on how many episodes there are going to be, or who is set to star? There's no official announcement about the cast yet, and insiders also said that there will be like around four or six episodes. Nice. All right. Well, I'm very excited for this to come out. I cannot wait to watch. Uh, and thanks for all the info, Joy. Thank you. All right, guys. Another big celebrity is making their way to Israel, and this time it's none other than the controversial rapper Azalea Banks. One thing is for sure, she'll be bringing tunes and attitude to Tel Aviv. It looks like Banks will be performing at Tel Aviv's Barbie Club on May 7th, and I'm not sure she can be more excited. She posted the announcement in all caps on Instagram, basically screaming, Tel Aviv, Istanbul, Seoul, London, Tokyo, Israel, I'm coming finally. She's on a mission to complete a prophecy that she wrote in her song Wallace, where she actually mentioned her dream to perform in Tel Aviv one day. 26-year-old is known for a lot more than just her music. She's made a splash with some of her public feuds on social media, and she just recently completed her last court-mandated anger management course after punching a nightclub security guard in 2015. Banks has been in the limelight since she was 17 years old and signed her first recording contract. So it's fair to say that many have been waiting a long time for her to finally visit Israel. All right, guys. Now for our Hebrew word of the day, there are many people on this planet who claim that they cannot survive without cheese. So today's word is chalabi, which means dairy in Hebrew. Chalabi is an important word to know in Hebrew because there are a lot of kosher people over here who do not eat dairy and meat products at the same time. That means lots of restaurants in Israel are labeled as soli chalabi, so clients know that they can't expect meat on the menu. I personally don't really like milk or yogurt, but I don't know what I would do without ice cream. So that's why I thank the cows every day and remember to only buy from Halavi companies that treat their animals well. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the weather forecast. The winter heat wave looks to be coming to an end. Expect a drop in temperatures with partly cloudy skies this evening. The low tonight should be about 49 or 9 degrees Celsius, and the high tomorrow will be around 67 or 19 degrees Celsius. All right, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.51 shekels to the American dollar. Remember to sign up for our daily newsletter at ILTV.tv and don't forget to follow us on Facebook 
at Israel English News and on Twitter at ILTV News. I'm Natasha Kirchuk, and thanks for watching.